What we'd like to do is to do uh, the Pledge of Allegiance at the start of the listening post this evening, if that's all right with everybody here. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you all for coming out um, before our regularly scheduled board meeting tonight. And on behalf of the Hopkins School Board, I want to um, thank you for coming and spending time with us this evening so that we can hear some input and feedback from, um, from the community on this topic. And in order um, for the listening post to be as effective as possible, I'd like just to kind of clarify and explain how we go about doing the listening posts. If any of you have been to them before or if you've never been to one, uh, we, we handle these just slightly differently than our regular board meetings. So in the past, we've had listening posts on various topics. And it's been an opportunity for the board to hear from the community um, on their thoughts on that particular topic. So tonight we're interested in really taking the temperature of the community on changes to graduation requirements. So to be clear, the board is not proposing anything tonight, nor is the board acting on anything tonight. This is merely discussion. Um, and so we want to make sure the community is aware of that. I know there are a lot of people that were not able to make it tonight. Um, and if the board makes the decision to move forward and um, and ask the superintendent to, um, to explore um, specific changes to graduation requirements together with his professionals, then at that point, there'll be more opportunities for the community to hear more about specifics on the graduation requirements. So this is merely the beginning of the process. And how we progress from here really depends on the feedback that we receive from you all. Um, if the community feedback is to not support changes to the requirements, then the board will likely not consider it further at this time. If the community feedback is that there is interest in considering changes to the requirements, the board will then likely recommend to the superintendent to work with his high school principals and school counselors to develop possible changes on what is best for our students and the community. And at that time, the board will be interested in receiving additional feedback from the community. So tonight we're really not getting into really deep specifics, but more general, general overview um, of, the cha of potential changes um, to the requirements. So to give context to our discussion tonight, the last time that Hopkinton High School's graduation requirements were changed, and I had to ask Steve to look this up because it was that long ago. Scary though, I was on the board at the time. <laughs> I do remember it, was in 2008. So exactly 11 years almost to the day, Steve pointed out to me today, that we increased our graduation credits from 20 to 24. Currently, the state of New Hampshire requires 20 credits, and Steve has created a crosswalk which we'll leave up on the screen for everybody that shows the requirements in case you didn't see them um, online or in prior meetings where we have looked at them. There is a handout. And there's a handout in the back as well. The board has already heard from the superintendent that one possible change would be the idea of becoming less prescriptive in our requirements and more elective. This is just one idea that, um, that we have discussed. The following areas are ones that can be considered when we look at our requirements. We can look at the number of credits that we require. We can look at the number of credits in a certain content area that are prescribed versus elective. We can look at online opportunities for credit, including things like VLAX and Running Start. We can look at experiential opportunities for credit, including independence and in studies and internships. And we can look at athletic opportunities for credit, allowing credit for varsity athletic participation. So here's what the board needs to learn tonight from you all. We need to know, and when you come up and provide feedback, if you guys could also take into consideration answering these, these points for us, that's really helpful feedback. Do you support the idea of exploring changes to our graduation requirements as they are currently? And if so, what areas, of interest, what areas are of interest to you, such as the more or less credits, or the more or less elective credits, or the increase or decrease in things such as online opportunities or experiential opportunities? So in an effort tonight to give all the members an opportunity to contribute, I will be limiting our um, feedback to three minutes per person. Now we're not busting at the doors, so if it goes a little over, that's okay. But I, if we had had a big turnout tonight, I wanted to make sure we gave everybody an opportunity to speak. And I'd really like to target to have this be a 30 to 40 minute um, opportunity for people to provide feedback. Um, the board will be listening tonight. We'll be taking notes. Um, but as I said at the beginning, there will be no action taken um, tonight at all. Does that sound good? We ready to roll? All right. So at this point in time, what I'd like to do is open it up. Um, a listening post is a little less formal. 
um, open it up to anybody here in, in our presence who would like to come up and, again, come to the microphone, state your name, um, and provide whatever feedback it is that you'd like to provide um, at this point on the graduation requirements. <laughs> I'm Charles DeGurtis. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for opening this up to everyone. Um, as the school board representative for students, I've heard a lot of different comments and complaints about graduation requirements. Um, I'm going to specifically bring up um, online courses. I just have been hearing from feedback from different students. I think this, I think the online course uh, like idea may not be the best because a lot of students are very against uh, having online courses such as VLAX. Um, I can personally have my own experience with VLAX. Uh, and it takes a lot of commitment and out of time involvement with your parents and just you alone. So I think a lot of students would um, be happy with not having to not having the well, I guess having the opportunity is nice, but I feel like a lot of students will not take it and I think um, the board should understand that many students are opposed to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Two. Two. So, Billy had a question. Do we, oh, do sorry, we have questions on comments? Sure, absolutely. Can I ask yeah. a question? Um, in your opinion, do you think their uh, opinion of VLAX or what have you would change if there was better coordination with guidance or something in that regard? Or do you think that that is properly covered and still there would be, you know, wouldn't be as popular? Um, personally, I think it's very well covered by guidance, but I just think still it would not be very popular among students um, just because of the high level of involvement you need. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Ella. Um, Charlie talked about the VLAX, and I'm going to be talking about the PE requirements. Um, you brought up that it's possible to switch like a varsity sport for PE credits, and a lot of students would really like that and appreciate that because um, I don't know the exact statistics, but a lot of our school body participates in sports, whether it's varsity or not. Um, so outside of school, they're already really busy, and if they have to um, add in a gym credit just so they can get the physical requirement, um, it makes it so there's less opportunity to take credits that they may want to take. Like band is almost always when gym is, so you have to sacrifice the band credit if you have to take a gym. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, sorry, another question yes, on that. So yes. this is this is oh, probably one of the biggest things I've I've heard back from from parents and kids and such. Um, this is really, Steve, can you tell, tell us a little bit about the state requirement on the gym piece? Is it, I mean, you know, the idea would be in a perfect world, Hopkins could be, could be creative in this and substitute, you know, a varsity sport or even coaching, you know, little kids uh, or whatever uh, in exchange for that, but perhaps the state doesn't allow for this or, um, like, what's the uh, guidelines that we have to follow for? It has to be um, one credit. Um, right, the state requirement right now is, is one credit, and half the credits are, are usually half a semester is uh, half a credit, so it's a full year of PE. Uh, credits are awarded by competency, so if we could satisfy physical education competencies, it is possible to do it in a, an alternative means. And is that, uh, how has that not happened so far? The, like what's been the what's been the sticking point in this? I, I just hear this comment well, all the uh, when time. When I was high school principal, I probably was a big influence on the sticking point. Uh, so and we can get in another time. I can certainly talk about the pluses and the minuses of the impact okay. of taking your best athletes and other people training. Like I was a varsity basketball coach. Yeah. I was not a physical education teacher, and I did not do physical education competencies. I was not a certified physical education teacher. I knew a lot about basketball. People who took the basketball they didn't learn about lifelong lessons. And Sports, well, they a little bit about sports and shit. But they only about a crazy guy like a whack job coach. So um, the, the vision about physical education is beyond just one sport for one specific time for me. It's about skills and, and opportunities to help you enjoy physical education for um, your life. So I had, we didn't do heart rate monitors and BMI. And when I was a basketball coach, 
We did zone, we did man-to-man, -man, we did full court press, we did conditioning, but it was very specific. But we, it is something that we can talk about, look at again, and Chris and Kareem and Dan and all that. It's certainly something other schools do. Um, but for me, from a Springfield College background, understanding the importance of a high quality physical education, that was a piece that we can always relook at. But um, it has been something that's common. And I, as high school principal and superintendent, I have tried to provide at least a whole picture to what physical education is about, which is more than simply participating in a sport you love, as opposed to well-rounded experience in athletics. But I'm not fixed minded on this. I'm growth minded. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good question, Billy. Thank you. Oh. Hi, I'm Darlene Gildersleeve. Um, I do very much support um, the opportunity for students to have more flexibility in their graduation credits. Um, I appreciate the proposal very much. Um, as you know, I have two kids at home that have um, varying disabilities, including dis learning disabilities. So having to take one whole extra year, it takes a whole year to do one credit. To do a whole extra year of math, to do a whole extra year of science and the one or two languages cause extreme duress to my, ch my children, extreme duress to the point of suffering with their mental health because just to get through the two mandated state credits was torturous. I can't even tell you how horrific it was to do the homework, the fighting, uh, the begging him, the bribery. <laughs> um, it was extremely difficult and he's going to a two-year, my son's going to a two-year college and doesn't require any math, um, the extra science, um, the 0.5 extra credit for social studies or the language. It, he doesn't require experiential learning. So to make it flexible for him, he wants to do music, okay? So to give him the option, as I said before on May 30th when Steve proposed it initially, if he could have spent that extra time developing his skills that he's going to need for his actual degree in his actual real world experience that he's going to do, um, it would make much more sense for him to have the flexibility of not having the extra credits that are currently required forced down his throat, so to speak. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is, uh, Matt had mentioned the wonderful opportunity for a dual enrollment with uh, Early College and Project Running Start. To have these extra credits forced would take away from kids' ability to complete dual enrollment opportunities um, at New Hampshire, um, at NH oh, sorry, NHTI. So if you look to the UK model of their O-levels and their A-levels, they really do graduate with an associate's degree in college um, while they're in high school. So they're killing two birds with one stone. And it very much is cheaper. And instead of like, Charlie, right? It's what Charlie mentioned. My son did attempt VLEX. And for some kids I do know, including kids with profound anxiety, VLEX is an option for them because the social anxiety of the classroom or being in school can really be harmful. But, um, so I would still like to explore that model, but I really would like to put emphasis on that dual enrollment model. Um, and it doesn't really require, it requires a signature from a guidance counselor, and then the student takes the form and they go to NHTI, and it can actually be taking courses during the day. Um, and it, it's just a wonderful opportunity to advance our, our kids, really. Um, the other thing I read about is for PE requirement. Volunteering to do yard work for people in the community with disabilities or elderly, um, it kind of gives them an opportunity to be out of the school environment and, but really helping people in the community. So I'd like to give that some thought. Um, as Steve had mentioned, fulfilling some um, PE or health requirements. Um, that could be done. Maybe you can do that like an hour during the week and then rest out in the field or two hours classroom and rest being like, you know, like you have some flexibility there. Um, Ella had mentioned um, varsity sports um, as an option for PE. Um, I do love that idea. However, I'd like all sports to be required because my kids will never make varsity, no way. Um, but they do do high school. My daughter has been doing lacrosse for a couple of years and loves it. So if she had the opportunity to use that exercise as a requirement. Um, I think that'd be fantastic. Um, I do also want to say that 
there are kids, when I was looking at um, the data that was presented in the last meeting, that are going to school for trades, um, I, for military. Um, there are kids that just want to take that gap year and work in retail. So they don't need any of these credits that are being forced right now to do what they want to do in their post-secondary um, goals. I told you before um, at a meeting, um, there was a Hopkinton student who was really eyeing an Eversource apprenticeship. So they attend MCC for all the electrical and all that kind of thing, but they work out in the field and when they graduate, they have the opportunity to earn 70,000 a year. And that boy, that student, doesn't need any of these require, extra requirements either. Neither do police officers, firefighters, plumbers who make $50 an hour, electricians who make even more per hour. So it's just flexible to everyone. And thank it you, Darlene. Thank you. You've some great examples. Thank you. Yep. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, those are great thank examples. Appreciate okay. it. So I'm taking that you support the flexibility, Very the much. idea of flexibility in the requirements. Very much. Yep. Got it. Um, thank I, you. I want to throw one more thing, um, one more thing in um, real quick, if no, one, if no one's waiting. Kids with disabilities really do struggle, and this program is really disability friendly. And if you look at Steve's data from 22 to 24 percent of students in every single grade have a disability. And so that's really something to look at. You're not looking at a tiny number, you're looking at a significant number of kids that would benefit with disabilities. Thank you, appreciate Thanks. it. Denae Belt, um, I absolutely support um, the school board looking at alternative options, you know, a more flexible um, credit um, base to where students can really focus on what their goals are and focus, you know, what they're taking in the directions that they want to take them. Um, I also, as part of, if you guys do decide to move forward, I would really love to see a lot of um, data and surveys from the students about what they would like to see, what would be useful to them, where you see gaps in applying for colleges or programs that you guys are going to, like where you see that you would need or want to see those things. Because I mean, I have a seventh grader and a first grader, so I know what I did when I went to college, but it's changed a lot now, and there's lots of different avenues and there's lots of different things. So um, you know, it's kind of hard to get feedback sometimes, um, but. Like that's where I would want to see a lot of information from them of what they would see as most beneficial. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to provide in support of the idea of making changes to graduation requirements or to speak not in support of it is you know, that's something that the board really it's important for the board to understand as well. Um, we have, you know, a few more minutes if anybody wants to Jump up. Hi, I'm Andrea Folsom. I really don't have very much to add to what has already been said, um, but I just wanted to voice my support in, in looking at the changes. I guess the one thing that I would probably look at um, would be, I love world language. I think much of the world speaks multiple languages, but I do think that is an area that could be looked at um, as far as maybe not Needing all of those. Um, Can you say that again? How sure. Many, yeah, how many languages you said? So, most of the world speaks English yeah. as well as their native language. Yeah. It's not necessarily the case in the United States. Um, so, I understand why having or learning a second language is really important. However, I think that that's an area that there could be some flexibility um, as far as whether or not students are obligated to, to learn. So, so, yeah, go ahead. But it's my understanding that kids start taking foreign language in seventh and eighth grade that applies to credit in high school, correct? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they start in seventh grade. Yes. Seventh grade, and that's applied. So they can take a seventh grade seventh credit that will count towards graduation credit as? Seventh no, eighth no. Seventh and eighth. Yeah. Yeah. seventh and eighth is one. Oh. And, and am I reading one's this right, that the state does not require a language? That's correct. Cool. So, I mean, on the language Thanks, piece. Andrea. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> we don't want to drive you away from that. Um, I mean, what, um, I guess there's some discussion that if we dropped 
the language, what would that do to, to the language departments? Um, do you think that would that would impact the language department? Do you think it would bring the language departments down a little bit if we did not make it a requirement to take a language? Yeah, I, mean, we, I, I mean, mean, it's hard before, to it's hard to tell, but before two thousand eight, there wasn't a graduation requirement. I don't think I don't think we've increased staff. Chris, I don't think we've increased sections of staff pretty much before two thousand eight. Now, no, it's been pretty stable with the numbers we have. What drives a, you know, what drives a this is your future? And I mean, most colleges or many colleges require second, third year world language, and that's still the majority of our population that is certainly on top of their goals. So um, it would be interesting to see how many people, but I don't think it would drastically, I don't think we lose 50% of our world language. We may lose some, but those, those would pick up sections otherwhere else because the 24 stays the same, so they're taking classes somewhere else. I mean, I worry a little bit about that because we have three. We're, we have three, and I think it's great to have the ability to be able to take three. And uh, I don't know. It's just something that again, yeah, another another about. piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, anybody else have some input? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Corinne LaJoy. I'm director of school counseling at Hopkinton Middle High School, and I do. Um, applaud all of you for looking again at graduation requirements because as Mr. Chamberlain said it's been many years and so I think it's always good to um, relook at things and make sure that we're doing what we should be doing to develop our students to the best of their abilities. That being said I think there are a few misconceptions that may be out there and I hope I can clarify them a little bit for you. First, we must do minimum requirements by the state standards. So in terms of math, we must give students three credits of math, and they must have a math experience every year that they're there. So if they're there four years, which most students are, they must take something in, term of, in terms of a math experience. Now that can come in the form of a different kind of class. For example, physics, chemistry, those are classes that have been certified to be to have math content so there is flexibility there um, we do a lot of creative options um, to satisfy the, ex the existing requirements for example um, the VLAX classes um, just in 2019 so far and we're not finished with it 68 VLAX classes have been taken we counsel kids all the time um, about VLAX and the merits and sometimes the drawbacks of an online class because in truth there are some kids who will, would struggle mightily trying to get through that program. We do ELOs, extended learning opportunities, for students who either supersede what we offer for them or have another idea that can meet competencies. Those ELOs all have competencies written in them and they can vary from American Sign Language to experiences in a hospital to um, anything that your brain can take you to. CRTC, we have well over 20 students attending CRTC, Concord Regional Technology Center, which is in Concord, which has a plethora of hands-on opportunities in the medical areas, in the, in the um, IT areas, in auto, in construction, and I could go on. We have a very, very robust internship program which satisfies or can satisfy the experiential re requirement. Those are the sky is the limit. If you want to talk about voice and choice, look at internships. Those are amazing and they use students' ideas as a, as a starting point. And then Danielle Meserv is our internship coordinator and she has multiple connections all around, does a great job with that. Project Running Start, dual credit classes. We are in the throes of signing kids up for dual credit classes at NHTI and we've now added one at um, SNU, Southern New Hampshire University. We have had kids going through the Project Lead the Way dual credit program, where I had one boy who finished an entire semester at Rochester Institute of Technology by going to Hopkinton High School. Um, in addition, when you talk about a practical requirement, and do we need a practical requirement? Well, 
we do require a category of practical classes. However, there are 16, count them, 16 options under practical that students can choose. And they range from wood to food to accounting to engineering across the board. Um, for experiential, we have 10 options. And those include the internships and the ELOs that start with a student's spark and move from there. Um, as far as the science requirement, three credits. Um, we require three credits. The state requires two. However, our third credit is uh, generated from the next generation standards of science. So we aren't adding things helter-skelter. And in my opinion, we are not asking kids to do something that's in the box. We are giving them a multitude of options and choices. We work very hard every day with kids to try to make their dreams come true. Um, and so I, again, I applaud you for looking at all of this, but I would caution you not to feel as though we have these, these static requirements in the box and kids are forced to move through them. We have lots of choice. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Jim has a question. Um, thank you. That was great. Um, I'm just, you mentioned next generation of sciences. I'm just curious if you could, um, for me, I, I'm in the past generation of science. So I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm just curious what the next gen, like what kind of courses are those? And my background is in English and school <laughs> <Perfect. counseling. laughs> um, The next gen, and perhaps Chris can jump in. He may know better than I. Um, the next generation um, um, standards are a set of standards that look at what, um, correct me please, either one of you, that look at what students should leave school knowing about. Um, Mr. Dixon, who is our department head, was adamant that there was nothing in our curriculum that talked about earth, earth and space science, and that in this world, um, with the condition of the environment and moving out into space, it was real important that kids have some general working knowledge of that kind of thing. So that's that's why that one has been added. And then we require three, but we have a multitude of other ones that kids can choose from. That's helpful, thank you. I hope you. that answers. No, that's great. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's actually really good to hear all the exciting things that are going on. I, I'm, I'm generally curious. Um, I work in higher education myself, so the, um, the demographics in New England are shifting dramatically, right? Um, high school age students will be declining 25% in the next 10 years. So by virtue, the nature of college requirements are changing. More, more schools are not requiring GRE, so I'm surprised to hear, like, I'm surprised to hear Steve, you say that there are a lot of schools that are still requiring multiple years of world language, because what I see is I see a ton, like, um, I see things going the other. Um, schools are going to be recruiting uh, high school students much more aggressively. Colleges are looking at things like Twitch, and like, I'm behind on things, but like, colleges are looking at things like Twitch, which is an online gaming platform, and credentialing students who demonstrate critical thinking and communication skills in video game platforms, and giving them college level credit for that. So, um, I, I guess the question that I'm asking is how much are we looking at where our students are going and what those colleges are looking for in terms of their requirements, knowing that demographics will shift and schools are going to be far more aggressive in the recruitment for those students. Do you want an answer? That yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think that college entrance requirements are getting tougher and tougher because students are coming to them more and more prepared. As far as having opportunities to do like the online gaming and that kind of experience, um, there are opportunities even at Hopkinton now to do to kind of explore in that area. For example, if you um, go on to VLAX.org and look at what they offer, they have all kinds of um, uh, computer-based ICT programming kind of kinds of things that I wish we had the the, um, the personnel to be able to offer, because I think you're right, I and mean, that's kind of the wave that it's going in, but I do think that there are opportunities that kids can access. 
they can take an NHTI course at any time as long as they can fit it in their schedule. Right now we have a high school senior who's taking an English class during the day because with senior privileges they can do that. So there are options to take courses off campus. So I think that we have an eye to that and we recognize that some kids, that's, that's their little niche and, and it would be good to help them foster that. So we do try to foster that within the confines of what we have as personnel and space and time in the day. I don't know if that fully answers your question. Yeah. Do councils, are you, do you believe that the world language is still a requirement that you have for most colleges that kids are applying to or am I off there? Um, so maybe I don't, most colleges say that they would like two levels of a language. They prefer three or two of two, but the reality of it is that schools across the country offer language. And so even at UNH, I shouldn't say even, I love UNH, I think it's a wonderful school, but at UNH, um, they would like three levels, even though they have it on the books as two, they would like three or two of two, but they get students who've had four or five. So the reality is we have to stay competitive with what the schools are getting, even if they're not requiring. So do you believe then that um, adding flexibility um, makes our students at a disadvantage then to like applying to, so if we, if we reduce the world language, for example, are students at a disadvantage to applying to local universities because most of our students are still going in New England. I would like language. to think that the guidance department does an excellent enough job counseling kids that for those kids that we know are going to move toward competitive universities that we counsel them with them, their parents, their teachers, that the language teachers talk to them and that still we have kids moving through the language program. Right now, we have two levels of a language requirement, but I will tell you that Mr. Kelly looks very hard and very long at some students who, because of a disability um, or some issue that is going on with them that makes language unachievable, um, he, because it's a school requirement, a, a Hopkinton requirement and not a state requirement, he has the capacity to waive that. And I will tell you unequivocally that he has done it on a number of occasions when it is really important to do it. We have the advantage of having a very small school. We know every one of our kids. We work very hard to achieve the needs of every one of our kids. And so with that language requirement, I think it entices kids, it moves kids forward to know that they have to do well in seventh and eighth grade to continue. I think it has that motivational effect on them. Um, I do think that they would, many of them would stay with it anyway, um, but I don't feel like having a language requirement puts kids in jeopardy because we have Mr. Kelly on the sidelines. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you so much, much for that. Coming. That really was yeah. education. Carolyn um, Keller, I just want to say my son has an IEP and it was not waived. Language requirement was not waived by Mr. Kelly when I asked him to waive it. Excuse me, darling. My son We're, failed language. No, I understand by, don't interrupt me. My son failed language by one point. He had to sit in the class all year long and suffer with his learning disability, which caused extreme anxiety, and he got a 69 in Spanish Thanks. from Senora Hassett. So don't tell me that Excuse me, darling. it can be waived. I know you've asked me not to speak, but this is that's crossing, all, crossing the line of say. inappropriate when we're talking about specific people. That's totally fine. So, thank you. But I, I, the flexibility is for the kids with disabilities. I, we and understand. when a staff member comes up and says that they're being, that they're watching out for every single student, it's not correct. From personal experience. Darling, thank you. That's all. Anybody else have anything they'd like to provide as far as graduation requirements? And if not, um, as I said, if the board uh, makes the decision to continue to um, uh, discuss and move forward with giving the superintendent some direction to um, explore, a lot of the feedback tonight was really valuable. Um, gives the board a lot of information to, um, to start with, but this really is the beginning of the discussion. And we really wanted to find out from, um, from the community whether or not we should continue to move forward to talk about it further, or whether the community was um, 
more interested in just continuing with what we're doing right now. So thank you, I appreciate it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to close the listening post and we're going to move on to our regular business meeting. We'll take about a two minute break for those people who need to go to the, run to the bathroom or get water, stand up, shake, do jumping jacks, and then we'll get started right away. Thank you all for coming tonight. I Reconnect us. <laughs> Excellent. All right, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Hopkins School Board on Thursday, October 3rd, 2019 at 6.08 p.m. We've already uh, done the Pledge of Allegiance before our listening post, and so um, I just want to say thank you to those who attended the listening post on graduation requirements, and so we'll move directly into additions and deletions to the agenda. And we do have a revised agenda. The architects and engineering firm recommendation completed the action item that says H.L. Turner. Um, I added an item to the debrief listening post if you want to just quickly do that and get some reactions. I'm going to give a, a brief update on where we are in independent studies. I did put the 2019-2020 enrollment. That's now been included in the packet. Um, and we do have a nomination in, um, packet for our permanent supposition. I also, hopefully, when I sent the email, there was a non-public, um, just a memo from the building committee regarding the background for that decision. Hopefully people saw that before the vote tonight. And I didn't add it, but if you would, if, if we do decide to do a non-public, we can add a student issue to that. Okay, great, thank you. That's what I've got. Excellent, all right, in the, in, uh, any correspondence? Yes, so I created a correspondence folder. Um, so a couple of emails pertaining to board items I included in there. Um, a, let's see what else. Um, I did include reaching hires in New Hampshire, which we think is pretty accurate to a potential, uh, the compromise budget, the numbers that you saw that that's in there. Um, there a, the a community member provided an IDEA report at the last meeting. I scanned that, made sure that was in there for this one. It also came to me. And there's a press release about trash on the lawn day. Um, so if you're interested on October 11th, 10th, 10th, it was close, uh, 9 to 1, trash on lawn day. Come here, we can take a look at our trash. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so those are my Fantastic. Those are the correspondence. Great, thank you very much. In the packet were two sets of minutes from our meeting on September 19th. I'll take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the minutes of the regular school board meeting held on September 19th, 2019. So moved. Sorry. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the minutes of the non-public session of the regular school board meeting held on September 19th, 2019. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. This time we have our first opportunity for public comment. If you would like to provide any feedback to the board, um, at this point, we'll also have one at the uh, at the end of the meeting as well. Do I have to say my name again? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, in case someone university. tuned in for the stream. Um, one, I have a concern. Tonight, there there was a family focus group for special education families to give input at our library. I really wanted to go as a parent of a child with a disability, 
and being on the board of directors at the Disabilities Rights Center, where I live and breathe this work every day. The library director scheduled her meeting over a month ago, and I can't understand why the library and the district kind of are in silos and don't cooperatively work together before scheduling the listening post. So I just wanted to say that I hope the district will include the library more in what they're doing, including giving the reading list of the books that the middle school and the high schoolers have to read to the library ahead of time so that when the kids go to the library and say, hey, I need this book, the director is not saying, what? I don't have these books in stock. So just increasing communication so that Dawn at the library can be prepared for the students. And also so that, like um, Jen Flagriff, who um, I started the special education parent group with, with Becky, um, and some other parents, she couldn't be here tonight and really wanted to be because she's at the family focus group. So it, it created a conflict for both of us that was, that was pretty difficult. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I had given you all a copy of the special education rules for children with disabilities. Um, that I owe you one because you had, you had some, that dance or you had something that night. So I owe I you I was one. dancing? Is that what you said? Yeah. You oh. had something going on with one of your kids that night. So when I handed them out, so I owe you that. Cool. Thank but you. Um, I just wanted to say that with everything going on budgetarily, and I know Becky will talk later, I just wanted to emphasize the legal requirements of the district to meet their obligation to kids with disabilities and the liability that can be posed if the district can't or won't because maybe you have parents that say, hey, what about JV sports? Or what about athletics? I just want to say that the legal requirements of special education take priority and take precedence because it's established by state and federal law. So I just really wanted to advocate for even in a budget crisis, watching out for the trust fund, right? And watching out for the rights of students with disabilities to have their services and to not have anything cut or change or shuffled around because really it would be the student that suffers. So I just really wanted to make sure that you keep an eye on that. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, at this point we'll move to comments um, from the Hopkins School Board. Ella, can we start down there with you this evening? Um, thanks for having me back for my second time. I'm <laughs> glad you wanted to come back a second time. Um, that's about it. Great. Well, thank you for being here tonight. It was important. Um, well, like Ella said, thank you for having me back. Um, I think it was nice to have the opportunity to finally voice our opinions for, well, not our, our opinions and our school's opinions. Um, because we've had so many students come up to us and say, hey, um, this is how we feel about this. And so it's nice to finally be able to give that out as a, on this platform. Um, so yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for stepping up first to the microphone this evening, <laughs> breaking the ice. Um, Mr. Chapin? I do think that um, you know this listening post, regardless of where we go with it, has created a ton of great conversation um, on, on both sides, with parents, with kids. Um, I think it makes Hopkinton really a special place to do listening posts like this because we, we're, we're looking for guidance, right? I mean, we're always looking for guidance and uh, to be able to open it up, to hear the different opinions, to do what's right for kids, I, th I think it's what makes our district very unique. And uh, I think, um, you know, I, I applaud Steve for opening up a listening post and, um, and doing, you know, and seeing if this is something we want to go through. We haven't done uh, a change in credits in a while. So thanks for that. Um, my second comment was, and I'm just looking at Norm's um, little sheet, is that the population? Yeah. I just was wondering, um, I, last time we talked, I, I, I was a little concerned about the number of preschoolers coming in. And I, I didn't know if after Labor Day, do more kids, have, have more kids shown up for preschool that you can what happened, attest to? What happened was, we, the, the first day is, is the preschool kids were there that day. Yeah. But preschool runs every other day and in the afternoons. So we only had a, a one piece of 
the pre we didn't it's like some of the there's thirty four kids in preschool. Yeah. There were twenty one who were on that first day and another thirteen came the next day. Okay, okay. And so it was more of like we always do the opening day enrollment who's there on the first day, but preschool that doesn't work. Because preschool, some right. kids come Monday, Wednesday, okay. Friday. Some There's two come. first days for preschool. There's so there. some kids weren't there on the regular first day. That right. was better. She said it better. Okay. <laughs> she, she said it better. Well, it's good to it's have that on. That was there. Was there. Was there. Was there. <laughs> okay. So that's what happened. I was going to address it when we hit that. Okay. Those are my comments. <laughs> Norm? I just want to thank everyone for coming up with the listen post. You know, being my first listen post, I've learned a lot in the process. and. We talked to Steve briefly about what to expect. He said, just listen. I said, okay, so I, um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. And uh, it's, I don't think it's something that we can make a quick decision on. We gotta see where we go with it and look at every angle. Um, last thing, I just want to say thank you to a couple of community members for their involvement with the building committee. Um, they were really reliable and uh, helping us with quite a bit. And it, it was uh, Jonathan Dunlap, Rebecca Betancourt, and Andrew Jennison. Um, thank you for them helping us uh, at our meetings. It's great to have the community be part of this process. It's exciting. So. Great. Thanks, Norm. Jim? Um, so I was surprised, and I didn't really know that we were going to be among royalty on this board, but we have a homecoming king and queen sitting <laughs> on us oh, here oh, today. Oh, I, saw so, uh, oh. I saw them drive by um, my neighborhood in their convertible, and um, it was pretty cool. So nice. anyway, congratulations, guys. Thank you. That's awesome. Not to embarrass you. Yeah. <laughs> Dang it. Well, I was going to say what Jim said. Uh, <laughs> but uh, congratulations. I, I thought that the open house here uh, was really phenomenal. Um, I thought it was well run, uh, smooth operating, and uh, great to meet a lot of the teachers who I have not had the opportunity to meet yet. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. It went, I thought it went very well. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. All right. So let's, um, if we can, move on to presentation and staff reports. Sure. In keeping with our rotation, Every other month um, in September, it was the building administration. October is the central office administration reports. And then um, we'll go in November, it'll, it'll swap back. So we'll begin with um, Benjamin Forrest, all director of student services. You want to highlight anything or questions? Uh, do I want to highlight anything? No, I mean, I think I appreciate the opportunity to write the report every other um, month. It's important for me to just sort of keep that focus and get everything aligned. Um, the first bullet point that talks about the positive achievements and the number of students. At the time that I wrote this report, I didn't have the 504 um, accessibility number. So there are 99 students right now that are um, eligible and receiving 504 accommodation plans, which is not, it's included on the graph, but it's not included in the narrative. So I just wanted to put that in there. Um, I think it's been a really overall, generally pretty smooth start to the school year. I contribute a lot of that, I think, to the people that work over the summer in our extended school year program because some, for some students there is sort of a seamless transition in that way. Um, and a lot of the building admin and staff put a lot of time into individual students' transitions from building to building or grade to grade. Um, and I think that that makes an enormous difference um, for kids. And I think it's really shown itself in terms of the transition overall. Um, we've got a lot going on with professional learning and professional development and that's been really exciting and it's always you know, nice to go to a meeting today and hear people off the cuff sort of talking about implementing some of the things that we've already started um, and to see that take off. That's not always the experience as an administrator that you get when you do professional development. Sometimes it just sort of goes away. So to see people excited about using that um, was really nice for me today. Um, I talked a little bit about the family liaison position that was here over the summer. We do have a really extensive resource guide that was put together that I think maybe um, next go around could be available and be polished up. We had to show it to our um, row team this last week to make sure there weren't any additions. Um, but I'd be open to other things that people want to include in that as well. And again, you know, in terms of ongoing needs and concerns, I think, um, you know, the political and fiscal climate right now, um, I think we've made some real forward movement the last couple of weeks. But certainly, you know, as the student services director, um, fiscally responsible is always a fine line with being fiscally mindful um, of what we're trying to do. We are under a lot, we are serving a lot of different masters right now, financially, I think, in the world of special ed in the district. And I think it has, you know, some effect on the rest of the world here in terms of what's available to them when we are required to do certain things. 
So I'm mind, I'm careful about that. I do think it's you know something that we have to keep talking about uh, moving forward and balancing that. So um, you know, our other big focus is on mindful inclusion um, and being really meaningful about what we're trying to do with the kids um, and moving from sort of the illusion of true inclusion to actual really drilling down for individual kids about what does it mean to be included um, and it might look different for different people and it's not just about being in the room with other kids so I think that's something that we've been working really hard to try to build into some conversations other questions off of the report right. I know it was not no questions for Becky report, um, so I, your report was great so thank you, um, thank you. Um, and I'm reading it on my phone because I forgot my computer and that work. No, 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 no. no. Uh, so if I'm looking at my phone, it's it's. No worries. Um, but I just want to go back to the the community. Um, you're in here. You talk about we should have more balanced community conversations around the special ed and funding. And so I'm just curious, what are do you have any other ideas for aside from sort of these meetings? Um, where else we can have those type of meaningful conversations? Because that is a question I get asked a lot in the community and I'm on the budget committee and they ask and so there's a lot of interest and maybe even a lot of misconceptions about that issue and so how, any ideas for how or I don't want to put I mean a spot. little bit of it is I think up to the board in terms of what would be useful to you for conversation. I'm happy to always talk about sort of the drivers of the special ed world financially. Um, I think the trickiest part about balancing regular ed monies and special ed monies is you know you do have laws that govern both. Um, New Hampshire is notorious for exceeding the federal guidelines in special ed, so we have in New Hampshire a lot more um, fiscal impact on programming because we exceed the federal standard in most, most special ed laws. Um, and so that creates a lot of um, trickle down. But I think a lot of it is, you know, if there's questions that you're repeatedly being asked, it would be helpful for me to know what they are. Um, and I'm happy to try to find a way to work that into my report. You know, there's, we could at some point, you know, consider some sort of, you know, really specific listening post or if there's something before um, budget uh, presentations to the budget committee that you think would be helpful for people to know, um, a quick little thing, you know, I'm happy to do that. Special ed is pretty, um, it's gray. There's not very many black and white issues with special ed. Um, so that's where it gets really hairy because people will say, well, I just want to, like a yes, no answer. Do we have to do this or do this? And rarely is that really actually the answer. It's almost always just the way of thinking about it. But I'd be happy to do whatever you think would be useful to the board in terms of increasing yeah, thank you. education. Yeah. Any other questions for Becky? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'd, I'd be interested in knowing more about, and forgive me if this isn't your area of, but like, what is are we doing? Is it regular ed? If it's not regular ed, it's definitely mine. Uh, well, like, <laughs> what are we doing <laughs> when it comes to like mental health yes. for our students? Um, not just for our you know, specialized students, but the broader population, I think at some point, it really doesn't really touch on Jim's budget related, but maybe a tad. Um, but I'd be curious at some point, because I mean, Darlene has, has mentioned this a, a few times, and I, um, I know other communities have asked as well what we're doing across, like across the, the district to support those students. So it doesn't have to be today, but, no, but at some point, I think it would be interesting And there's been you know, quite a bit of legislation around mental health, mm -hmm. um, and even mental health first aid, um, suicide prevention, awareness um, that will go into effect over the next year or so. You know, and I think the, the piece of the conversation that has come up several times very recently is um, trying to separate to some extent the mental health conversations from the school safety conversations because quite often they are getting lumped together and it gives the illusion that kids who have um, struggles with mental health are not safe or making our schools not safe. That may not necessarily be what we're trying to promote. Um, or true. We have loads of people who struggle with mental health or who are managing that um, that have nothing to do with making our schools unsafe. So to try to keep separating that piece a little bit. But that, that will be an ongoing topic at the legislation as well as in every school district, I think. Yeah, I agree. So, just a just, quick, go ahead. Oh, just go a ahead. quick comment. I, I, you know, one thing that I've done, I've referred people to her, and I just want to say people have just come back to me saying thank you. You've Thanks. been very helpful with uh, answering their questions and helping. Um, you know, I'll echo their thoughts too, that informing us and helping us and educating us about this helps us make a formal, a better decision as a board member. And um, I explore you, you know, if, if possible, to, what, what they're asking for, you know, 
mental health, anything else that we can do that you feel that's important uh, would help us a lot. Thanks, Norm. Thank you, Becky. Appreciate it. Mr. Stone. Sure. I have a few things. Yeah. Uh, just trying to sort of cover a little bit of summer as well as, of course, the first month of school. Um, trying to get the highlights. Of course, the summer, you know, is when schools kind of wind down a little bit. Um, obviously, we still have a lot going on, but uh, it's our busiest time, so it's our really vital time to prepare for the new year and do all of that. And then, of course, our second busiest time is the first few weeks of school as everyone returns and we uh, put to the test all of our preparations. So uh, it's only been a, a fun start, but a pretty good one overall, and certainly other than some challenges that I highlighted at Harold Martin that have come up the last few weeks. Um, you feel pretty good about the start. Uh, other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm just curious what the power issue was at Harold Martin. Uh, what was it? <laughs> uh, we actually, one of the issues was as we added more, uh, we expanded the scope of the security project with additional doors. Uh, we actually overloaded the power in the room, blew out one of the circuits, uh, just because we added so much more. Um, we also had a battery backup unit fail rather spectacularly. So that was <laughs> uh, we actually got that swapped out uh, last night, which was good. Um, and then hopefully we're back to normal operations. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for your, uh, and that was mostly weekend work. So we mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, 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 I'm trying to not. Um, allow my curiosity to ask like detailed questions that I really have no like interest, <laughs> no, no reason to ask, but I'm yeah, gonna ask anyway. Like, like, I, I would be curious at some point to understand what types of technologies our students are using in the classroom outside of a Chromebook and outside of like computers to know. Like when I was a teacher, we had those smart, you know, smart tabs where we would vote and we could engage and we had smart Clickers. boards and all kinds of like cool cool things and so I don't know and I'll relate it to the work that we could do in terms of you know um, perhaps trying to pilot and fund some of those things if they're not currently in use yeah so I think I mentioned uh, we are pushing out a large variety of interactive projectors in the last few years so that's been a big push so uh, we have probably a quarter or a third of our classrooms equipped with those so far and continuing on um, of course all the classrooms have a projector teachers routinely use the laptop as a uh, yeah, we do have a few, a very small number of sets of the interactive um, uh, voting thingies, as Mel Thornley likes to call them. Technical, technical, technical term. I forget what they're called. So. <laughs> a technical term. They have some silly name. Voting thingies for smile. Um, uh, but that's, we sort of struggled with the cost effectiveness of some of those systems uh, at the elementary and middle school levels. Uh, we found that definitely some types of hands on. We also are really trying to push into the area of what we call physical computing, including uh, so your angle screen, where you have, you're doing computer science stuff, but you're doing it on devices that you operate in the real world. So motors and uh, lights and all that fun stuff. So you can actually you know, see the results, not just on a computer screen, but you're seeing it in you know, a device driving across the floor or you know, spinning or doing all the fun stuff that you can do with some of these great kids. So, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any any other questions for Matt? All good. Thanks so much, Matt. Thank you for the report. Ms. Clark. Uh, yeah, so uh, you got in your packet um, the report. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's uh, lots of different things. I'm not going to focus on any of the um, financial stuff because we usually talk about that. Um, you know, we are looking at having a um, program that's going to be able to um, schedule facility use at all three of our buildings. We did test one uh, a year or two ago with Maple Street that had some flaws in it, so we did find one, which is exciting, and we'll do that. Um, as well as, um, we're gonna be going to a different version of um, our financial system, um, which for a lot of people won't bring anything different, but what it does do is give us the ability to get um, the student activity accounting on that system and not be on the other system which would make Matt's life um, really happy because um, that's on a server. Uh, and so we have to keep that server until we actually get them off of it. Um, they used to be on QuickBooks, which if anyone knows, QuickBooks is not the way to go um, because there's not good audit controls and stuff. So um, we went to our old financial system and we just 
haven't had the ability to bring them on this way. Um, and I'm just uh, really excited about the, um, I didn't even put it in my report, but um, the facility project and how um, steamrolling ahead um, we're moving. So, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Michelle? Just go ahead, Norm. No, you go, Mr. <laughs> Have there been any issues with the security um, security project in terms of? No, um, we just had last minute things, and I think some of the gap was that our facility director left in trying to figure out what we still was outstanding, and so there was a transition with that. But we're on the home stretch. And actually, uh, next week, um, the new facility director and I are getting in depth training on that because the one that had that is no one here. Thank you very much. I have a came mind. Have we submitted our application to the state for uh, the lead issue? The Not grant? yet, because we haven't. Steve and I need to meet on that to determine if everything is at a level that we don't want to do anything else with um, okay. before we move forward. Because we can only do that once. Yeah. So um, I have a big folder on my desk with all kinds of <laughs> copies of okay. items that we have done. Um, and so we'll be able to put in for five parts per billion and up. Awesome. We're just trying to make sure we've got it all before we submit because once we do, we don't want to leave anything on the table. Perfect. Thank you, guys. I, Michelle, I just had a really good question. So the, the upgraded version of e of eFinance, is it going to give you more capability to be able to manipulate reports? Not to my knowledge, but okay. I haven't fully dealt with I was just curious because I know we've had to have them do some work to it's create really, reports um, for us. but I don't know Cognos. And a lot mm -hmm. of the time when you want to customize a report, that's, that's where you have, have to go. To okay. Um, so, but that being said, I have um, started to do some of the testings in areas that are not in the reporting. Okay, great. Awesome. So, um, I, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll I'm just curious. It's one yeah. of those because we've had to, you know, we've essentially had to contract out some report creating for us. And some of that is simply just resources in house that mm -hmm. there isn't that time to delve in because of all the other duties. Yeah. Not out of lack of desire. I think we've had it in the plans, but things that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Michelle. You're on. Um, you know, the report stands. I really, I've always talked about this is meaningful reflection for me. I get a chance to look back at some of the reports and see what we've done. Um, just a couple of highlights. Um, and we had a leadership team meeting today, and I was in a workshop yesterday, and I was fascinated to hear that the historical job description of the superintendent is not an educational leader. It's really just the manager and the principals were left to all the educational leadership. And I just thought it was fascinated by that. And it's shifting now. More, print, more superintendents are taking it on because of the achievement and things like that. And as you know, the passion, I really enjoy curriculum instruction and assessment, of course, all aspects of the job. September and October allows, really is the time that uh, instructional leadership can be the majority of my time. Uh, once I go Halloween to St. Patrick's Day, it's, it's budget. Um, so for this first two months of school, it's really a pleasure. Um, really enjoy, um, I, I walk the buildings with all the administrators, we try to do it as often as we can. Spending some time in classrooms with building administrators, trying to integrate a reliability about what you see as instruction. I'm a and I spend the time looking at a number of teachers, dropping, was dropping out, uh, dropping out, and just really discussing what we saw. I found it incredibly rewarding and valuable, and I hope to continue that. The other piece to highlight, um, the one word theme, um, one of the things that I've come in my 11 years doing this and all the work with Cassie, and. Cassie Ackley and Trauma, this notion of reflection and how we do it. I'm really trying to encourage our faculty to be reflective and reflect as a team and would encourage the board to think about one word as we go into the budget process. Liz and I actually, as I wrote about, Liz and Amy were the ones that really both turned me on to this notion of one word. We use it as a theme this year. Pretty powerful. Um, I got a couple of hundred responses from community members as they chose a word. I'll continue to send them out to the faculty as inspiration. Um, but this notion of reflection, what kind of promise we have and what kind of, um, how we fulfill, you know, personal and professional fulfillment as we reflect about a word of focus. It's, it's been a good start for me as a lot of opportunities to talk to faculty about reflection and practice. Um, you know, the concerns, the budget stuff, um, collective bargaining just because of time. Um, you know, I still, it still comes across my desk that uh, my timing or the expediency of getting done some in the, in, the, in the time that others would is, is difficult. It's difficult to manage everything. I think some of the, some of the concerns that are raised, how come I haven't put this up yet, how come I haven't done that yet, it's difficult to manage with the life, but hopefully people understand it does happen eventually. 
doing a little bit of innovation improvement. Um, visible curriculum's going well. Uh, we're gonna, in January 1, there will be stuff. Um, Bill will talk about this, I'm sure, next month in his. There will be um, things up January 1. And a, and a, and a joy is even know the new faculty. Uh, next month, I, I dig in with new staff induction, which is a real joy for me, a real strength, I think, of what we've done. Anybody wants to come and, and see how we induct people in the Hopway in Mag 7, I always, uh, always enjoy talking about that. So that's a quick summary. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Anything for Steve? Bill? Just a comment. I think you take full advantage of our small district by working with your leadership team. So I think on a bigger, you know, bigger campus, bigger school, you are more of a just an administrator, but you take advantage of the opportunity yeah, to sort of talk with the other heads and decide what's best for education because you like education, these guys like education, you know, you can collaborate. So yeah, I'm with you. Keep, oh, and it's, and it's a real privilege. Anything else for Steve? No, but I guess um, I would I'd like to ask that we include these four reports, these four of them, right, into, um, as attachment to our minutes when we post them online. I think they're, they're wonderful reports, and I think they're pretty powerful, and I, I think attaching them to the minutes kind of lets people who want to see what we're doing sure. be able to read these rather than having them lost sort of as, as attachments, you know, otherwise. So I would make that big there request. You got it. Yeah. Right now they are up. Um, I tried to put some documents up ahead of this meeting. So in a, there's a, a thing called support materials, and the support materials are the seven documents ready for this, yes, but we can attach them in minutes, too. Yeah, that'd be great. But they are available ahead of the meeting, a little bit ahead of the meeting. We're trying. Yeah, Matt. Uh, just one quick comment and acknowledgement, and thank all of the uh, folks in the administrative team. Uh, I know that oftentimes uh, academic administration uh, is seen as a job that has summers off, and folks leave at 2.30 in the afternoon. And uh, as somebody also in the field, I want to I let you know that I appreciate the three or four nights a week at least that you are working late. Uh, and so, and Steve, if there's anything that we can do to help provide you some more air cover or some more support um, feels like that is within the, the realm of the job. Please let us know Thank so you. that you can have the quality of life that you uh, deserve as well. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. It's a, uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Do you want to move on to the enrollment? Absolutely. Had I read the packet, <laughs> or had I would have seen this bill. Um, I can pop it up, but what we've got, so this is the October 1 enrollment, which is going to go up any second, really? um, is, so this is a big day, um, this is tragic, so this is reported um, to the state as October 1 enrollment, you know what, I forgot the colors, no, no, we got, so sorry about the colors, oh. so this is, so I'll work on the colors. Um, kindergarten 64, we've got 311 at Herald, which is a little bit down from, from last year, October 1. 204, um, you know, I put that in, I don't know what's going on. Um, 159, uh, 316 at the high school, which is up a little bit, 990 total. This is where we are, a little bit less than last year. A little bit, um, pretty close to where we were on opening day. Um, so what happens at the next meeting? Uh, the second meeting in October, uh, Michelle utilizes these numbers to present uh, uh, tuition rates, and the, and, the, and the board votes on tuition rates. Um, we, as we, we have oh, six, seven, eight, nine kids on tuition. We do estimates until the, the actual rate is set, and then we pro, you know, obviously average them out the rest of the year in 10 monthly payments. But this is our enrollment. I will before I will revise this and make sure all the colors and all that fun. So any questions for Steve on the enrollment worksheet? Steve, do you? Okay, go on. No, Steve, did you see a little bit of a more people homeschooling their children with this kind of going down with the staff? Question. Um, and we can look. Homeschool is very difficult to track because they only have to notice we once. Always know. They yeah. notice, notice us. We did, we did recently get a few homeschools. Yeah. Um, nine right now that we know of. I mean, so you know, there could be people that don't notice us. You know, haven't given us notice. Nine that are identified or nine that are taking classes in the district? Uh, nine that are send us letters and they, okay. they have to notice us once. Okay. Um, so that's a good way. What we, what the big change from last year to this year was uh, in migration. Um, we were pretty flat year to year. Year before we were like plus 25. Yeah. Um, so that's the big, we didn't see as many move-ins in between grades as we have in the last few years. 
and I know Chris talks about this, he's had some years where he's netted 25, 30 just at middle high school. I remember net 33 once when I was a building principal building years ago. Do we, do we inquire, you know, when a parent decides they want to homeschool, do we ask why? Um, sometimes. Um, sometimes we reach out and make sure we can realize that they can have a combination. They can cover world language, they can come for cameras if they want. Um, or to make sure that there's no And in the reason. past, sometimes I've done, sometimes parents have wanted to have exit interviews for me for if they went to a private school. And sometimes, depending on my calendar, sometimes, uh, but, you know, if it's a family that I've known for 20 years and, and they, why they make a decision now, sometimes we want to know. Yeah, I think it's, it's important, you know, it's, it's, it's feedback. You Absolutely. Know, you know, it's something that I'm interested in, like, and why, why parents decided to take it, homeschool? Is it something that's happening in the school that, you know, that's not being addressed? You know, stuff like that, data mind for that. I think it's important. You know, I do think that if, if for some reason they, they are homeschooled, leadership should be reaching out and say, hey, you know, is everything okay? You know, I know that they have to send out notification to the district, but I think it's important, you know, that we know why. Sure, and if, if I, you, I can, I can you certainly do that, that we know why people are homeschooling. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're if they're kindergarten, they're they're in kindergarten, and then they're going to first grade, and they decide why they're not continuing their education. Uh, I think it's important to. Are you, are you asking me? Or I just don't, I'm just no, I'm just in general. <laughs> <laughs> it's just in general. I, 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 I mean. Well, I, Last well, year, they just feel they can do a better job. They just yeah, feel they can be a better job. They're more qualified. They know their kids well, better. Good, I don't know that's our business. Right. I mean, it's it's exactly. Very, it's a very private yeah, decision. I agree. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Last year, I had a parent contact me and, and was traveling for a year. Had an opportunity to travel. Yeah. Homeschool was the more efficient, more convenient. They, we sent our curriculum yeah. with them. Uh, we had a lot of cooperation yeah. from our, our, our schools. They kept up and it was a unique opportunity business-wise that they could have a year in Europe and they came back and joined us this year. Um, some are very private about it. Some okay. are very free to let me know. Yeah, um, okay. Typically, people aren't too shy about saying if there was a specific reason. There's a number of homeschool organizations in New Hampshire yeah. that probably you could look up mm -hmm. and they would like yeah. Yeah. There's lots of information about yeah. why people choose to homeschool. Um, and in the past, the school district, you had to submit scores and things like that for your child if you were homeschooling to show that you were meeting your obligation. But yeah. since that has changed, it was changed because the majority of homeschool parents don't want the school involved with their homeschooling, quite honestly. So that's, you know, was sort of the, you know, line in the sand. I, I mean, the, the problem with that, well, Again, this, but we're still on the. We're, we still bear responsibility. Um, we do not. Not any problems. longer. We, used we to do not. not. We okay. Uh, and the, when I started as superintendent, they had to show educational process, uh, progress, and they had to have an evaluation tool. And that is completely. Uh, it is laissez faire. I right. hadn't noticed once. We don't have. We have held harmless. Um, the issue is sometimes if they have gone for a while and they come back, trying to catch them up is, is an additional effort by schools. Um, but when we have a, a number of kids. And, we can work with Matt and our, we have a number of kids who are coming in for a class. Um, I, I tell the story, we had a homeschooler, uh, and they can play in our interscholastic athletics, we had some homeschooler make their, young, their youngster not with an academic and eligible. And so there you go. So it's, uh, you know, it is, it's a part of all public schools. I wouldn't say we have more or less than anybody else to be honest with. And, and sports too, right? They, they can play sports, sports. they can play sports. one class, I mean, two yeah. classes, half a class. If they support services, they can make referral yeah. to the district. As they should, right? They pay taxes. Right. right. Thank but you, guys. Okay? I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, we just, something like that, it, it doesn't really inform us of anything that's yeah. going to, to affect what the decisions of the policies that we make and things yeah, like that. Yeah. It, you know, from a curiosity standpoint, sure. I mean, right. some people have personal, very personal reasons why they choose to homeschool. Um, all right, great. And it, it is different, Norm, from when a student decides to go to, say, another, to a private school, when we do reach out and yeah. just, just understand, yeah, you know, what the decision is. And okay. um, that's a different, that's a different process. Got it. So, right. Thank you, Liz. Great. Thanks. All right, Steve, let's move on, although I've buried my agenda, so we'll right. bring it back up. There we go. Um, uh, let's move on to items for board discussion. So, um, building committee. Sure, I wanted to just and I'll yield to, to Jim. I just want to start off this in case there's some people very interested in this combination. But Jim, if you want to do a quick update and then talk about the firm. Sure, I'll, um, I'll kind of combine the two together if that's fine. Perfect. So um, I, I just want to start by, by saying what a great committee the building committee has been. Um, it's The last month I think has been a lot of work, um, a couple of late nights, 
a lot of great conversations. Um, so I'm going to rewind just just a little bit and just talk about the process um, that sort of brought us to this recommendation tonight. Um, so we uh, put out an RFP, uh, I don't know, about a month ago. We, um, Steve, Michelle, um, and others did a walkthrough for um, those interested in putting a proposal, so they walked them through the schools. Um, we received two proposals um, on the 19th uh, of September. Um, they were due, um, and then we asked um, the committee and then some um, citizens who volunteered, Norm had thanked them and mentioned them, um, but we asked that group to review those proposals and then come in on the 23rd, so it was just the weekend, so people spent their weekend reviewing the proposals, um, to come in on the 23rd um, to share some thoughts, and so we had a meeting on the 23rd in which we went over the proposals, um, we, we talked about the written work that the, the companies had provided to us um, to really prepare us for the interview, which we had on the 1st. Um, so on the 1st, we had quite a full room of all of us, and then, um, the, the, the two firms came in um, for interviews starting at 5.30 and then the second interview was at 6.45, so about an hour each. Um, and these were in public, so you can go back and listen to them. Um, and I would just say, uh, and I think the committee all agreed, I mean, both firms provided um, really good interviews, a lot of great information. Um, both very qualified, respected um, firms that could, that could do the work um, that we're asking of them and, and do it very well. Um, only one firm provided a picture of Maple Street School on their cover of their proposal, and so um, that's, I shouldn't say that, it's not why we went with them, um, but we chose to go with H.L. Turner. We went with H.L. Turner, um, who is a Concord-based firm, um, and, and really for a number of reasons I'll, I'll lay out here quickly. Um, one of the reasons was um, I think the, the committee felt comfortable with their, the way they um, put their pricing code and they had a one lump payment um, rather than sort of a payment and then some other um, addendums on there. And I think the committee felt very comfortable with, with the payment structure. Um, and H.L. Turner sort of does all their work in-house. They have architects, they have engineers um, that all work for the company. So they're all part of the team and under the roof where uh, other firms um, sub some of those out, and it's, there's not one really better than the other. Um, both have merit, but I, I think the committee felt really comfortable with sort of the in-house capacity that H.L. Turner has. Um, they provided an aggressive schedule for us, which is something the building committee has been um, um, excited about, is, is moving this project forward quickly, staying on schedule, which reduces our overall costs. Um, and that aggressive schedule was very appealing. Um, I mentioned they're a local company, their headquarters here in Concord. Um, uh, some of the principals on, on our project would be, um, they're Concord based, they, they live down the road from us, so having that local context um, was very important. Um, they spoke a lot about their experience with grants, with you know, state funding, and that being something they wanted to keep an eye towards, which was appealing. Um, and then with, you know, it's important to have a team in a, that you're interviewing you feel very comfortable with, and I think um, all of us on the building committee felt very comfortable with them, their approach, you know, how they interact, um, and then also some of the, um, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, not the examples of projects, but the, the people that they've worked with and the recommendations, there's the word, um, that were provided to us um, from other districts that they've worked in were, were impressive. Um, and so um, we're very excited, I think, to bring forward um, to the school board, hopefully for your approval, um, moving forward with H.L. Turner as our architect um, and engineering firm. Um, which then, if once that's set, we have um, our construction attorney, we have a pro owner's project manager, which I always get wrong, um, and then we'll have our, our um, design team. Um, and so the next step in our journey will be to um, hire a construction manager, um, and that's going to really help us uh, nail down all of our pricing, and we'll work with the architect, the building committee, uh, members of the community, teachers, and faculty, faculty to really um, fine tuning the design and make sure we're getting what we want um, and then we can afford it and then we can um, start getting construction done uh, quick. So it really feels like this is a major decision, one of the major decisions for us to get over and to get that team really working and um, to really move us forward um, rapidly. Great job. I don't know if Thanks anybody so else on the team, no, um, there's great. a lot of us here who want to Just add. thank you to everyone who stayed till nine, you know, really to make that. <laughs> yeah. And it is an action item tonight. Yeah. Right. Is everybody else that? Yeah, really, Bill, Matt, and I are probably the ones that need to be asked that question. 
Are we all set? Yes? Are you okay with the nomination? Yeah, all right, Jim, thank you so much for all your guys' hard work um, leading that leading that effort. So, Do you want to debrief the yeah, listening any, post any briefly? Any initial reactions, or if you yeah. want to just think about it, put it on the agenda for, for marching orders, thinking. but didn't know if yeah. you want any initial reactions to it. Let uh, marinate for a while. Mm. Yeah. You yep. got it? Yeah, thank I was you. thinking that in, uh, you and I can look at agenda what the whole, you know where we've got space and maybe an agenda coming forward but I would think within the next month that we would put it on there so we don't let it get too far into the rear cortex so before the budget starts to at least de debrief and make a decision um, knowing that budget will be coming on rapidly in in uh, November November December so is yeah. so everybody good with that in the next couple meetings that we put Very that good. on there okay great thank you and thank you all for participating in it up next, uh, along a couple, about a year and a half ago, I designated September um, School Security Month and we give an update to the board. We moved into October just because of the busy um, September. Just a, a couple of things. I think we've fundamentally changed our approach in a lot of ways in our school security and safety. Um, I'm very pleased of, of the progress we've made. We've done a lot of things in the last year and a half when we started this comprehensive improvement plan. A couple of things is to make sure the board's aware. All schools last year went through a Homeland Security audit and evaluation, where, and the Safety and Security Committee is reviewing those documents. But that was a good exercise. Each year we have to, our emergency operation plans have to be revised, signed by Chief EL, signed by Chief McCor. Those are submitted, uh, submitted on time. Um, we do have a quarterly meeting, uh, and Chief EL, Chief McCor, they come. We talk about issues about safety and security. We have um, regular emergency operation roundtables that we do. Um, one of the fundamental changes really under the leadership of Chief Rapport was we turned into an, an avoid, deny, defend district. This year, we've kind of established as part of our opening training, we had in our training module ADD, which I think was well received and it's important that we do. Uh, the leadership team as well as the Safety and Security Committee is really being trying to be deliberate and purposeful on how we drill these at all different developmental levels. You know, kindergarten versus senior in high school and how we look at those are much different. And I trust and the collaboration between our administrators and our school counseling staff and each other and how we do this is an important thing. Um, what we have coming, um, I think, in the next couple weeks is one of the things that didn't hit, but we have a tip line, an app tip line coming. So students will be anonymously be able to send a tip to school counseling, eating disorder, worried about bullying, worried about weapons, things like that. Um, you know, it's been actually it's been a passion of mine since Port Gaskell. In the old days, they had a secret um, locker. People used to actually put them in a locker. When I did it, we did seven four six twenty twenty. But kids don't use phones anymore, <laughs> so now it's an app, and we're directing it. It was on the agenda today. We'll get to it. But all our school counselors, this isn't a discipline thing. It's about a support. And so, if there's concern for an app, we'll publicize it and make it do that. We're exciting about that. Last year, all our schools participated in Stop the Bleed training. Um, so, so we've been doing a lot of things. We're, one of the areas that we have to make progress on, and, and Chris and Rebecca and I have been talking about this and how to find space for social emotional learning program at the secondary level. Elementary, it's, it's a little bit more flexible. You know, secondary, it's content, a little bit content piece. Um, Chris and Rebecca are, are excited about this. And we're trying to work collaboratively in some of our, to, to find some space in our school schedule. Um, we hope to make some progress in the next few months, allowing some space in our schedule for some social emotional learning for our secondary. Um, so that's a piece that's still on the to-do list. One of the things I wanted to address, and it came from a community member at a couple of meetings ago, who was when we were in the music room looked at, at some of the new doors and saw some some glass. Um, so a couple of things. If we remember the the. One of the drivers for the change in doors in our district in the beginning was the performance contract. And the performance contract was about energy conservation. It was that's where we did it. So the, the plan, the, the impact was replacing old doors and making, you know, it wasn't back then the focus on the performance contract was not hardening of our schools. You know, we had a hearing about the performance contract. It was about saving money and getting all this stuff done. That being, and we also, when we're doing the performance contract, we try to be very mindful of the facility project. And back then, in the performance contract proposal, the facility project still had significant redesigns of our entrances, including a, a, a relocation of Harold, a, a much different design here, and a whole relocation of the high school with portals right next to the office, which were, uh, you actually were going to walk in and see someone right away. 
So there wasn't this necessity at the performance contract level because at some point we thought the facility project was going to take care of the significant hardening of our squash. Thank you. So then what happened next? Then we got the grant and the facility project and we got loud feedback about 29 million. If you remember, we did an extensive survey and we had our speed SWAT about 10 million and, and, and the safety security committee and, and uh, myself as a leadership, we felt that what we have now, which is much more hard than what we were 18 months ago, is, is the standard of most high schools and most elementary schools where we have controlled access, we have a portal, and that standard was at least up to par with most schools. So since then, so there's also a second piece of an infrastructure safety and security funds. We just heard a report on the first on how HL Turner did significant hardening of schools in one of the projects. We will learn from that, and we can certainly, if, if the board and building committee want to use you know, some funds to, to add to that, that's an option. At the safety and security committee, we talked about hardening. We go further in a hardening of schools. We have to just be very cognizant of this notion about doors without glass. For, we have multiple competing concerns of safety. For example, we won't have classroom doors, even outdoor classroom doors without glass, because we don't want, frankly, we don't want to isolate and totally close in adults with kids. We want passive abilities to look through glass and make sure that adults feel safer, kids feel safer. We don't completely isolate in solitary confinement because it's not safe. So we want glass, we want someone to walk by a door and be able to look into a classroom. Um, so we won't, even if it's outside, there's an outside door, we replace it. We want someone to be able to look in. And I, I talked to Ben, Levin. Ben, Ben, 100%, if he's doing a musical lesson with someone, he doesn't want complete privacy. No one does anymore. You, don't, you want to be able to have people around. So a competing interest is how people feel safe when you're working in small, small groups. Uh, Jay Burgess talks about when they harden a uh, the door at the police station in Concord, how heavy the door was. We have to worry about that with a little. You know, we, we do worry about the size of the door and how much we're hardening and make sure littles can handle the door without risking themselves. So those are some of the issues that we take. The, the, the question was whose responsibility? Ultimately, it, my responsibility is to implement and, and, and to work on this. If the board feels that, that we should have adjusted and hardened our schools further at that time, then I'm the one to be held accountable for it. I do think, though, that if we do get another opportunity, as some schools have done, not many yet, there is a way to take our current glass and harden more with films, BASFF. BAS, BASF does it, Jay and I saw a presentation. So, you know, I often talk about 20 years. I don't believe that I've made a 20 year error in this. I believe we implemented the performance contract. We've been mindful of all the pieces. And there's still an opportunity through lens and through film to give Chief Pecora the four or five minutes that he wants. That being said, you know, I've been here for a long time. You've heard this. The fundamental way we keep our school safe is how we care about kids, how we care about each other, relationships kids have with adults. Chief Pecora spoke passionately at a lot of safety and security meeting about we're going to know the person that comes in, and that, can see, that person is going to come in and see Amy, see Bills, Rebecca, Chris, me, Michelle, Matt, Becky is a supportive, wonderful people who care about them, or the, or the opposite. So I'm very pleased and proud of the work we've done. It's been extraordinary. $2.1 million facility project, $400,000 in safety and security. You know, last year we went from a $29 million project to a $50 million to a tender that got 78% vote at the town. We, uh, we've done ADD, we've done Homeland Security, we have doing a monthly minute on it, we're keeping it in front of people's brains. And if you ask me an, an evaluation of this, we've made substantive changes um, with an awful lot of work and, and our faculty sleeps better than they used to. Could they sleep better? Probably. But we've made significant progress. But ultimately it is, it is my responsibility. I'm certainly willing to take that responsibility. Um, any but, questions? Oh, can I just pop are. it out? With any it. questions for Steve on any of those pieces? At this point, no. Thank you, Steve, for, for addressing that. Why is there a fly in here? <laughs> Jim has it's only, it's, I'm just curious. I mean, we heard some pushback last year about the cameras being installed. I'm just curious at how public response, if you heard any other pushback on the cameras? No, not at all. But um, um, Becky and I were at a, a law conference. We have, we have to catch up some policy and some things because they made some changes on it. Um, no, um, you know, it, it's a little bit, it's still over one week number of cameras. I know that people are looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think overall it's a part of our approach. Uh, but we do have to make sure, one thing Chief Bacora and I have to make sure MOU is solid about when police can have access to it. That's something that I think uh, she and I both yeah. learned at, uh, last week, so that's on our to-do list. Uh, but I, I, think, I think it's going pretty well. Thank you. Anybody okay? Great. Thank you Thank so much you. for that Good update.
A um, couple of real quick things. Um, two weeks ago, we talked about and uh, completely serving the pleasure of the board on the decision about the farmers market. And to say we did have a request from them to have, if if necessary or if desired, to have the option to, to do a sale of items with alcohol in them. Um, and I'm talking with the school board's association attorney. And just a reminder that um, this is a board action. The board has the authority to do it, and so there is an action tonight. Action item tonight. I did it just for the first season. And remember, this is a seasonal November. I forget March, April, right? something like that. So um, I can certainly ask for reports. It will be in. I believe it's this site. And why it works really well is they can unload right here. Bathrooms right there. Space right here. One level parking right there. Um, I think it's going to be a wonderful. Place and sites where they have more room and they go around. Um, and I, I was, um, it was a compelling case made to me by Dave White and a number of people. It's just a wonderful community gathering place at the farmers market, and anything we can do to support them, I think, is winner winner chicken dinner. And Amy goes, that's okay. <laughs> so as long as she says so it's there. Okay. So there. Any questions for Steve after our last meeting? <laughs> no, you guys are all set to. Uh, to do the action item in this one? Yeah, we're just looking at Jim because yeah, he's, yeah, he's well, this came up in in your other your other part time job, um, and <laughs> yes. so he you, did. that research has led you to feel comfortable with us. Yeah. Okay. It did come up at select board though. Well, this has been a conversation. Oh, okay. At select okay. board um, providing alcohol on on town owned property, mm -hmm. and so it's 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 gotten talked to death over the over the years. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I asked, actually, I think I asked that same question to Steve. Oh, yeah. Like, hasn't this already? You know, has, hasn't there been discussion mm -hmm. at a at a higher level with it? Yep. Okay. And it's well within your authority to grant or not. No. Serving the pleasure, vote your conscience. We'll yep. Okay. Sounds good. As long as everybody's ready. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So let's move into policy. Um, three seconds. policies that you've seen quite a few times: character and citizenship, policy. school and family partnerships, and the seventh and eighth grade credit. Um, the, the procedure, if these are supported tonight, they get cleaned up, all the strike throughs and get adjusted, they go up on the website, and uh, we, we fire up. Um, and then um, we will start, Matt and Norm and I will start the next iteration of policy. Everybody okay? Yeah, I did have one, just when you're cleaning it up on the, I took my, my well-defined <laughs> notes here, my board. It was on that one. No, you just had the, which one is this? The school, family, and community partnerships. You did a great job of um, putting parents slash guardians, and you just missed one on the oh, fourth okay. bullet. I just want to just thank you. Sorry about that. No, it's quite all right. We will hit it. I'm a big parent guardian guy. <laughs> Steve, on the um, policy piece, I can't believe I'm commenting on something on policy, but um, <laughs> did you read it? Yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> Is this seventh eighth grade high? This is Hopkinton High School, right? So if you have a seventh eighth grader who are is that Kearsarge or whatever, do, what what is do, to what extent do we give them? Sure, the same? Uh, that's a that's a great question. So um, in seventh and eighth grade, they, they can transfer to us if it's an accredited school. So we okay. accept credit 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 seamlessly from accredited schools. If school, if someone attends a non-credited school, like if someone and, and a, if someone, for example, was homeschooled. They would come and they take. We put together a proficiency test to make sure they had the fundamental skills to move on, and that's what Chris, Kareem, and Michelle Cottonwa in that area of world language they put together. What they believe is to make sure, and this isn't about it's making sure kids are prepared. Um, so yes, they uh, now there's a, a couple of different approaches though. So some schools do FLES, which is eight weeks of three languages. That would not be credit bearing because they haven't had enough, you know, enough time to achieve the competency. That's an exposure program. We are not an exposure program, we are an insured learning program. So it depends on what comes. But people would understand if you took French for nine weeks, you wouldn't come here and get a credit. That's not a, that's not controversial. Okay. Does that make sense? And it's understood in the policy how it's written out, right? Yeah. Yep. yeah okay. And um, this really codifies a practice that we've had for a long time. Good. Everybody okay? All good. Just run through some quick uh, personnel. Um, so um, we, we are moving forward with uh, the candidate for the district maintenance worker. Just This opened up because our district maintenance worker moved up to the director of facilities, so this is within the budget. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. um, next is um, permanent, um, permanent sub. I think Chris is our third shot at it this year. It's our third shot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it will be a charm. So um, this is a, a permanent sub comes in and subs for people throughout the day. It's, 
Um, it's, it's within the budgetary amount. Um, this is a certified teacher who worked in a nearby district who was like a little bit more variety spice of life. Uh, middle School Student Council is uh, Beth Stern and um, Sue Roberts. Uh, musical Acting Director, uh, Paula Demers. Theater is Kevin Gardner. Musical Choreographer is Nene Allen. Um, so we're anxious to get those codified in Schedule B. Um, and then uh, Junior Varsity Boys Basketball is uh, Jeff Merrill, one of our new teachers who coached last year at, at his Wyndham. He's coming to coach for us. Dan likes to get this as soon as we have somebody new to get it out to make sure that we can get that filled. That's why it's a little bit out, but we'll have the whole slate coming in the next month or so. Okay, great. Um, but uh, just looking forward to seeing Jeff coach. Um, just want to give you where we are. And so the practice of independent studies has been, um, there's about uh, $4,500-ish budgeted for independent studies. Anything within that budget has the board has allocated the responsibility or the authority for me to approve. If, if there were requests beyond that, if we exceeded the budget amount, I would bring it to the board. Why you're bringing it tonight is just because of the certain of the budget situation, right? So right now we are uh, we are granting there are three independent studies, uh, and so that means there is more room left in this budget item that we haven't um, taken yet. All these three are for youngsters to continue. Um, Two are to continue beyond what we offer, uh, beyond a fifth year of world language and beyond uh, BC Calc, which is extraordinary for kids have uh, really that passion. And another is an opportunity for young students to fit because the schedule didn't fit. Um, so we're gonna, Michelle and I have, uh, are trying to get a handle on where we are with the state funding, where we are with special ed aid, where we are with all the hiring. She's working really hard trying to get us that. Based on that, all that information and the board's pleasure, Second semester, we may be, we could freeze this and use this as part of the, the reduction or part of the savings there. I'll keep you posted on it. But I'm comfortable with these three, and um, we're in pretty good shape for second semester. Okay. Everybody okay? Yeah, we're good. Um, we have an overnight trip to Puerto Rico that was included in the packet. Uh, this is Interact. I don't think I said that, but Interact, um, they, have, they used to go to Honduras. Um, Nicaragua, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, those are uh, un those are places right now that, I, that Chris and I would be comfortable Absolutely. recommending. But we are uh, Puerto Rico, some good work, and there's a program in there. That's great. And, um, we are considering this an international trip. It is an international trip. You know, uh, so this is that's, <laughs> that's why we're considering it. Um, so this is preliminary approval. And are they traveling with another um, rotary again, the way they did with the previous trips? I don't believe so this year. No. They're, they're using okay. a, uh, an organization. Okay, oh, okay, like a, okay, gotcha. And very pleased, um, I had a chance to see Rescue and Jesse, um, and Bill spoke about that at the end of his report, about bringing in an author, talk about the Boston uh, Marathon, uh, and, and, and the use of a service dog, an incredible assembly, and I think, right, Bill, because of this, every student will get a book, this is, this is or is No, every classroom. Classroom, oh, classroom, sorry. <laughs> Um, so we think that's a good thing. And then um, the town revolving fund, talk to Neil, and the, and you, the town revolving, is that the, if that's the right term for the recycling, they are going to um, give us $500 to go trash on the lawn day. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. That's all I had. Wonderful. Great. People. Thank you. Any further questions for Steve? Before we move forward? Excellent. Last opportunity for public comment. Andrew, if you have anything at this point you'd like to provide we'd be happy to, happy to have you. Thank you for tough it out. Yeah, awesome. Um, just two things really quickly. I loved hearing that you're looking for a space to work in social emotional learning for um, the secondary school. The, um, for those of you who don't know, that was sort of what I did. I did crisis intervention and suicide prevention for many years. Um, I would just encourage you to not only look at those social or those soft skills for in like, real life interactions, but also for online interactions. I think the world that we live in right now, what you see you. in real life and what you see online can be different. Um, and then the other one was just the donation from the Huffington PTA. It's for the ladybug. Oh, it's not for the other no, one? Oh, not. I'm sorry. That's what okay. you think? No. Thank book. you for clarifying that. What <laughs> 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 Jesse Rescue Books? No, this is, this is Ladybug and, and, and Stoneface. Uh, so I messed up. Thank you. Thank you. I thought it was one. Actually. The record. Oh. 
you ask for questions. Well, we give so much. We sit correct. Andrea is always on today. We want to make sure they get proper credit. Well, I was thinking really thank you. And I thank you for the correction. I apologize. No. For the record, he asked for it. Thanks so much, Andrea. I just love the gesture. Yeah, there we go. But I love that, too. All right, so at this point, we'll move into um, action items, the calendar of all the dates. Don't forget about the joint meeting with the select board um, on October 21st. Thanks for coming, Andrea, at 5.30. Conference days, if um, those apply to you. And, of course, Indigenous People Day coming up in a week from Monday. How far out do we go with the calendar for the school board period? I'm sorry? How far out have we gone out for the school board for meeting dates? All the way to the end of the year. Every except year. And the budget, uh, in one of the versions, maybe see if we can pull it back up again, is the all the budget meeting, all the meetings okay. for the budget, because we go every week for a period yeah. of time. We're done until, right until, we're, until we're done. But we okay. go, yeah, we stay on the same schedule unless there's something special, okay. such as the joint meeting. Perfect. Um, things like that. Thank you so much. No problem. At this point, I'll move into action items. I'll take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the Building Committee's recommendation to, pr to approve H.L. Turner as the architect and engineering firm for the project approved at the March 2019 meeting pending successful negotiations. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to approve the Kentucky Farmer Farmers Market's request to sell beverages with alcohol content and provide limited samples for the 2019-20 season. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to approve policy IHAK, Character and Citizenship Education, fourth and final reading. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to approve policy KA slash IJO, school, family, and community partnership, fourth and final reading. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to approve policy IMBD, high school credit for seventh and eighth grade coursework, third and final reading. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Wayne Schmiel, district maintenance worker, pending final approval of the superintendent of schools. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? And I apologize if I mispronounced that last name. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Jacqueline Clattenburg, permanent substitute, Hopkins Middle and High Schools, pending final approval of the superintendent of schools. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of the following Schedule B positions. Middle School Student Council Advisors Beth Stern and Sue Roberts, Musical Acting Director Paula Demers, Theater Play Director Kevin Gardner, Musical Choreographer Nene Allen, and JV Boys Basketball Coach Jeff Merrill. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to grant pre preliminary approval for the Hopkinton High School Interact Club's overnight field trip to San Juan, Puerto Rico, February 20th, 2020 to February 28th, 2020. So moved. Good luck. Be safe. I'll second. I have a second person. Second. Yeah. Getting there. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to accept a $1,200 donation from the Hopkinton PTA to provide HMS and MSS Ladybug and Stoneface <laughs> books. So you get a ding ding. Second. Double ding. Any further discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to accept a $500 donation from the town of Hopkinton Revolving Recycling Fund. Correct? Yes. Or for? For or from? From. So from. Okay. So we're not giving them five hundred dollars. Uh, we're taking five they're giving us five hundred dollars. Whatever okay. it is, I moved it. Okay. <laughs> we got a second? I did okay. second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, at this 
point, we have a need for non-public sessions. First, no. Well, yes. No, work will be done. no action will be taken at the end. I'll take a motion for a non-public session for the discussion of matters as per RSA 91-A, colon 3, Roman numeral 2A. So moved. Second. And is that for A and C? A and C. A and C. C. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. A and C. Yes. I need my letter police down here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 And yes. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming and being part thank of the meeting tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for volunteering last night. Thank you guys. Thank you for